We are privileged this evening to welcome back David Ferry, the Sophie Chantal Hart Professor Emeritus of English, a legendary teacher at Wellesley, a superb critic and poet, one of the truly distinguished translators of our time. David honors us by returning to Wellesley to mark the opening of the new house center and by allowing us on this occasion to honor him. Introducing David to you, it's necessary but not sufficient to name some of the books that he has written. His landmark study of Wordsworth, The Limits of Mortality, published by Wesleyan University Press. His prize-winning collection of No Country I Know, New and Selected Poems, published by the University of Chicago Press. And especially relevant to this evening's program, The Five, also prize-winning volumes of translation that he has published with Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux between 1992 and the present. Gilgamesh, a new rendering in English verse. The Odes of Horace, a translation. The Eclogues of Virgil, a translation. The Epistles of Horace, a translation. And forthcoming this spring, The Georgics of Virgil, a translation. It's necessary to name these books and to allude to those prizes, because by doing so, we can give some sense of the range and the focus and the distinction of David Ferry's work. But it's not sufficient, because a list of book titles can give no sense of the magnitude of David's impact on this institution or of the importance to many of us here of his presence and his example. I'm sorry to put this extra pressure on him, but I have to tell you that David is the finest reader of poetry I've ever heard. And what makes him a great reader is the same thing that makes him a great teacher and a great writer, the extraordinary sense of force and the extraordinary gratification produced when great force finds its appropriate form. Nobody I know has an equivalent gift for making us experience almost as a physical fact the ways in which achieved literary language is the product of tremendous power and pressure of feeling, realizing itself in the exactness of the right word, the right phrase, the right line. I'm very grateful to David, my mentor and dear friend, for accepting the invitation to be here for this special occasion, for making it special by his presence. And I'm grateful to my friend and colleague, Larry Rosenwald, for accepting the invitation, a rather daunting one, to share the stage with David and to respond to David's remarks with his own. David is Larry's friend and mentor, too, and so Larry might feel a special pressure that I can sympathize with, but I know that he's adequate to the challenge. Larry is a person of remarkable and remarkably wide-ranging accomplishment, the Ann Pierce Rogers Professor of American Literature here at Wellesley. He's a musician of uncommon ability, a learned musicologist, a leading scholar of American literature, a political activist, a librettist, and a gifted translator himself from at least five different languages. Larry will speak immediately after David's reading. I won't try to anticipate his remarks, but rather just look forward to them and move towards them by turning over the stage now to our honored guest, David Ferry, to speak to us about the experience of translating. Wait a sec, I have to get some stuff out here. <laughs> really appreciate what uh, Tim had to say. I may turn out to be maybe the most inaudible reader of poetry that there is since my voice like his is in trouble. Um, I'd like to start, I, I regard this as a reading uh, with some uh, commentaries concentrating on two or three poems a little uh, at a little more length than uh, than others, but mainly as a reading with some brief um, uh, comments. That's partly because I love the things that I've that I've worked on, and uh, uh, and I want to uh, express that um, by by reading them with uncertain, uh, very uncertain uh, confidence in the in the results, but with a, with a sense that. Uh, that what I've done has been done with the best of intentions, at any rate. Uh, I want to start with a with a translation from a, a a German poem of the 13th century that um, Larry, uh, my mentor in many ways, uh, had uh, directed my attention to in. Uh, 
In my last two books of, po of poems, uh, there are a lot of poems about people marginalized by their uh, vulnerability in various uh, ways, and that writing some of these poems, especially poems about uh, street people, um, I began to look into some of the literature about wild men, and um, Larry um, uh, pointed me uh, towards a poem um, that um, was written by a poet named Der Wilde Alexander. Um, we only know uh, four or five poems, I think, by him, and um, and this is the the very um, best of those. Um, I've called the poem when we were children. I should say that in the last uh, stanza of the poem is based on the story in the Bible about the wise and foolish virgins. When we were children. I remember how at that time in this meadow we used to run up and down playing our games tag and games of that sort and look for wildflowers, violets and such. A long time ago, now there are only these cows bothered by flies, only these cows wandering about in the meadow. I remember us sitting down in the field of flowers, surrounded by flowers and playing, she loves me not, she loves me, plucking the flower petals. My memory of childhood is full of those flowers, bright with the colors of garlands we wore in our dancing and playing. So time went by among the wildflowers. Look over there near those trees at the edge of the woods. Right over there is where we used to find blueberry bushes, blackberry bushes, wild strawberries. We had to climb over rocks and old walls to get them. One day, a man called out to us, children, go home. He had been watching from somewhere in the woods. We used to feast on the berries we found in that place till our hands and mouths were stained with the colors of all the berries, the blackberries, strawberries, and the blueberries. It was all fun to us in the days of our childhood. One day a man called out in a doleful voice, Go home, children, go home. There are snakes in that place. One day one of the children went into the grass that grows high near the woods among the bushes. We heard him scream and cry out. He came back weeping. Our little horse is lying down and bleeding. Our pony is lying down. Our pony is dying. I saw a snake go crawling off in the grass. Children, go home before it gets too dark. If you don't go home before the light is gone, if you don't get home before the night has come, listen to me. You will be lost in the dark. Listen to me. Your joy will turn into sorrow. Children, go home before it gets to be dark. There were five virgins lingered in a field. The king went in with his bride and shut the doors. The palace doors were shut against the virgins. The virgins wept, left standing in the field. The servants came and stripped the virgins naked. The virgins wept, stripped naked in the field. I gave this talk the, the title, The Experience of Translating, knowing that the the, the experience, the experience, was going to feel pretentious as if I could speak authoritatively about what the experience of translating is. But just calling it some experiences of translating seemed too diffident, or like just a report on what I did last summer. 
I think I can show with some examples some things about the experience of translating that other poets, and especially some other poets who are also translators, would agree with, though their examples would, of course, be different. My points are obvious when stated out in very general terms. First, no translation ever gets it right. Second, the experience of not getting it right and knowing exactly how you're not getting it right is an intense and valuable form of reading in every way worth the humiliation of not getting it right. Third, as experiences of translating develop and new translations are done, unexpected relationships develop between them that change your life as a reader and possibly, uh, and possibly could change it as poet. And maybe I can say there's a fourth point, very important to me. The opportunities a translator poet has to make use of other people's poems for the purposes of his own work. About this fourth point, if I hadn't been working on poems about street people and other marginalized figures in my books, Dwelling Places and Of No Country I Know, uh, I probably wouldn't have come across and translated poems like When We Were Children and adapted poems like Rilke's Song of the Little Cripple um, or his Song of a Drunkard uh, or the poem from Old Babylonian that I call Prayer to the Gods of the Night with its hapless people waiting in an ancient town for the law courts to open up next morning. Um, I just want to... Um, to read a couple of those poems. The first is a new poem, actually, that's adapted from Rilke. I call it At the Street Corner. It's about eight lines long. At the Street Corner. My body's all twisted up. Maybe my soul's all right. It's got no garden to grow in the soil of. It hangs on my skeleton, terrified, beating its wings. Look at my hands, little wet toads after a rainstorm, hopping, hopping, hopping. Maybe God didn't like the look on my face. Sometimes a big dog looks right into it. And this is part of a translation of Rilke's Song of a Drunkard. I don't know what it was I wanted to hold on to. I kept losing it. And I didn't know what it was except I wanted to hold on to it. The drink kept it in. So at least for a while, I felt as if I had it, whatever it was. But it was the drink that had it and held it and had hold of me, too. Asshole. And this is a poem, one of the oldest poems in the world, um, a poem from Old Babylonian. Uh, I don't call this a translation, but a rendering, since I, I worked from the scholarly uh, English uh, text to turn it into, um, into a poem. Um, I called it Prayer to the Gods of the Night. It takes place in a Babylonian town the night before the law courts are to meet. Uh, and it's, uh, it's spoken as a kind of, uh, of, uh, of prayer um, by a kind of priest uh, asking that somehow the uh, law courts will uh, come to just decisions. 
prayer to the gods of the night. The gates of the town are closed. The princes have gone to sleep. The chatter of voices has quieted down. Door bolts are fastened. Not until morning will they be opened. The gods of the place and the goddess Ishtar, Sin, Adad, and Shamash have gone into the quiet of the sky, making no judgments. Only the voice of a lone wayfarer calls out the name of Shamash or Ishtar. Now house and field are entirely silent. The night is veiled. A sleepless client in the still night waits for the morning. Great Shamash has gone into the sleeping heaven. The father of the poor, the judge, has gone into his chamber. May the gods of the night come forth. The hunter, the bow, the wagon, the yoke, the viper, Ira, the valiant, the goat, the bison, Gira, the shining, the seven, the dragon. May the stars come forth in the high heaven. Establish the truth in the ritual omen. In the offered lamb, establish the truth. But beyond this point about the use one makes of translation for the purposes of one's own work as a poet, though very important to me and though I think it always figures for any translator, one's choices of what to translate derive from and reflect one's own other life and his, pre and his preoccupations. But I'd like to concentrate on the other three points as they come together in an account of several instances of translating. First point one never gets it right. Second point, translation is an intensive act of close reading, and this is most intensely experienced in the space of one's realization of exactly how one hasn't gotten it right. Third point, the different poems one has translated enter into one another. About the third point, when I translated the Faunus Ode of Horace, or his tree falling out. I hadn't worked on the, on the Georgics, and uh, since I'm not a Latinist, uh, I, I knew them, but not uh, uh, well enough. And working on the Georgics has made me read these odes differently, not contradictorily, but differently than the way I'd read them before. About the first and second points, for me, it's often true that the very most thrilling evidence of Horace's marvelous workings, or Ronsard's, or Virgil's, or Baudelaire's, very often is discovered in that space between their workings, what their language is doing, and my own language, unable to get it right, though I must say, touchingly well-intentioned. And all these points are interrelated. The first three, at any rate, all show up in every example of the experience of translating. The first translation I ever did, and that's on page one of that uh, the handout. The handout isn't really necessary, but it could be helpful. Was of a sonnet by Ronsard, just shortly after I got out of graduate school, I think. Quand vous serez bien vieille au soir à la chandelle. It was the experience of working on this translation that first showed me my limitations and also, thank goodness, showed me that they're not always all my fault. Quand vous serez bien vieille, au soir, à la chandelle, assise auprès du feu, dévidante et filant, direz chantant mes vers en vous émerveillant, ronsard, me célébrer du temps que j'étais belle. Lors vous n'aurez servante, 
voyant telle nouvelle, déjà sous le labeur à demi sommeillant, qui au bruit de mon nom ne saille réveillant, bénissant votre nom de louange immortelle, je serai sous la terre et fantôme sans eau, par les ombres myrteux, je prendrai mon repos. Vous serez au foyer une vieille accroupie, regrettant mon amour et votre fier dédain. Vivez, si mon croyez, n'attendez à demain. Cueillez dès aujourd'hui les roses de la vie. When you are very old, at night, by candlelight, sitting up close to the fire, unwinding or winding the thread, marveling, you will murmur, telling over the songs of the dead. Ronsard praised this body before it became this fright. Not one of your companions dozing over her spinning, but hearing you say these things in her old woman's dream will be startled half awake to bless your famous name for the praise it had deserved of my immortal singing. I will be under the earth, my body nothing at all, taking its rest at last under the dark myrtle. There you'll be by the fire, a hunched up old woman that held off my love for a long look in the mirror. Listen to what I say. Don't wait for tomorrow. These flowers in their blossom go quickly out of season. I remember with such pleasure the quietly elaborate syntax of Ronsard's clauses, broken in on quite suddenly at the end of the first quatrain, where she has imagined saying to herself, Ronsard me célébrait du temps que j'étais belle. Ronsard praised this body before it became this fright. And I remember being proud of that line of the translation because of the way it ended with that rhyming word fright with its two meanings. One, the recognizable social idiom, I look a fright. The other, looking forward to the terrifying, frightful grave. And I now think, though I still like it, that my solution to the line violated to a degree the tone of du temps que j'étais belle or, you might say, melodramatized what she was saying. Before it became this fright, sounds more like the English metaphysical or cavalier poets or like Renaissance, uh, restoration comedy that I was reading then in a concentrated way as a graduate student in the 1950s. It sounds like Lady Wish for it in Congreve's late, uh, late 17th century play, The Way of the World. I look like an old peeled wall. And there's a smart-ass quality in the solution that it's odds at odds with the noble regretfulness of du temps que j'étais belle, back in the time when I was beautiful. This is even more the case, and, and that belle, belle, that rhyme, uh, chandelle, belle, nouvelle, Immortelle, when once the word belle has been used and that phrase has been used, the, that, that rhyme echoes uh, sonorously and sadly back and forth through the poem as I now uh, hear it and as my translation gave no account of. Uh, this is even more the case with another line that I was also proud of. There you'll be by the fire, a hunched up old woman that held off my love for a long look in the mirror. In fact, I was knocked out, callow self-praiser that I was, because of the phrase for a long look in the mirror that I found to express the meaning of votre fier des dents. And now when I reread the translation, I see that once again, Still more noticeably, 
I was reading Ronsard's poem as if he was an English poet of a somewhat later period and that I had been reading that English poet in graduate school. The line now seems to me to violate the ordinance, the decorum of Ronsard's poem and of the great line stated with elegant abstractness, regrettons mon amour et votre fier dédain, looking back with regret at the time of my love and your proud disdain. There are so many more possibilities in the analysis of her character, her situation, her culture, the manners of the social and erotic world of her youth in that regrettant mon amour et votre fier dédain than the simple vindictively witty ac accusation attempted by for a long look in the mirror provides. The accusation of vanity is in the Ronsard line, but there's a nobility in that proud disdain that isn't there in that long look in the mirror, that diagnosis of her problem as vanity. Still, I had my own agenda, in this case also a formal one. I already had the subsequent line. Listen to what I say. Don't wait for tomorrow. And I couldn't find a rhyme that worked, not in sorrow or borrow or furrow or shadow or anything else. And the open-ended, vowel-ended mirror seemed to work with tomorrow. I was looking for and had to find a technical solution for a detail of the English poem that I was writing. And I used this, mo this motive to say from the gallows, Dry John Dryden said that every translation is a speech from the gallows. To say from the gallows that for a long look in the mirror wasn't all my fault. I can go on with the criminal evidence. I will be under the earth. My body, nothing at all. Taking its rest at last. Under the dark myrtle. There's a power in the sudden declarative beginning the sestet of the poem, Je serai sous la terre, that may be there to a degree in I will be under the earth so directly rendered. But my body, nothing at all, doesn't get what's there in the spooky fantôme sans eau that so denies Je prendrai mon repos. That boneless, unanchored, wraith ghost must be reposeless, and indeed is, in a sense, proleptically the reposeless speaker of the poem, Ronsard. In my translation, I will be under the earth, my body nothing at all, taking its rest at last under the dark myrtle, I should say, though, that I had other fish to fry. I needed a rhyme or off-rhyme for myrtle, and at all supplied one and taking its rest at last pleased me because of the internal rhyme or off-rhyme of rest and last. The translator is always writing his own poem with its own demands and exigencies and its own self-pleasure. There are the wonderful sounds in the Dire chantons mes vers en vous émerveillant that I tried for in the sounds of marveling you will murmur telling over the songs of the dead. But it's not the same music, of course, and it's a thinner music, and the ambiguities in En vous émerveillant and the relation of this inward marveling, marveling at, her, at his songs, marveling at herself, marveling inside her dozing self, en vous, at her beautiful once self, and the praise it had deserved, and the recurrence of his verse, may vere, almost anagrammatically, or in a kind of sleepy confusion in émerveillant, uh, uh, dire, uh, uh, in, uh, how does the line go? I'm sorry to, uh, to, uh, chantant, dire, chantant, may vere, en vous émerveillant. Um, is, uh, um, and the relation of the sounds of this to Dumi Sommeillon and Nusayach Reveillon in the next quatrain, let me say them over again. Dire chantons mes vers en vous émerveillant, 
on s'en me célébrer du temps que j'étais belle, nor vous, nor les servantes, voyant telle nouvelle, déjà sous le labeur à demi sommeillant, qui au bruit de mon nom ne s'aille réveillant, bénissant votre nom de louange immortelle. Uh, and uh, the rich sounds of this create the environment in which she is at one with those other old women, her servants around her, spinning and telling over the songs of the dead as if she and there, the poem doesn't tell us how many uh, companions she had, but I bet it was two because they are the three fates as well, telling their own fates as they tell over the songs of the dead. Uh, as, uh, as, uh, as our own lives are told in the spinning out of them. Uh, uh, she, marveling at the past within herself and about herself and about his poem about herself, is only brought, ha brought only half awake by the noise, bruit, of the name Ronsard. And I get some of the comedy of bruit the noise of his name that rudely halfway woke them up, the comedy that undercuts to a degree, though only to a degree, the superb, arrogant chains of his acclaims of his louange immortelle, the praise of his immortal writings. My point is twofold. Regret at how much I missed, but the knowledge of how I missed it, how I had to miss it, through lesser talent, of course, and through the intrusions into the translation of another mode of poetry provides me with an intensive and pleasurable reading of what it is I had missed. Translation is, in my opinion, the closest form of close reading, and the knowledge of its errors are, so long as one has tried to do one's best among its positive values. And in this vividly intensive process of learning how you didn't get it right is the most vividly intense process of learning what it is to write, what it is to be a writer at work. I also, when I translated this poem, I, I, didn't, uh, I didn't yet know, or I knew in a general way, uh, that Horace was behind such poems. Uh, but I just want to read a poem that is very different from the Ronsard and from my translation, but related to it and ancestral to it. It's the 13th Ode of the fourth book. <coughs> I call it Tulicia. It's Tulicia, but I couldn't print that so people could read it correctly in English. Tulicia. The gods have certainly given me what I asked for. Lysia, Lysia, yes, they have certainly done so. Lysia's getting old and she wants to be still beautiful and still she goes to parties and drinks too much and a little teary sings a, a tremulous song meant for the ears of Cupid. But Cupid's eyes are on Kaya playing the lyre for Cupid scorns the old. So tell me, Lysia, what is it you expect? Cupid scorns you. He scorns your graying hair and yellowing teeth, old crow that watches from a dead oak tree as winged love flies by to another tree. Neither your purple gowns of silk from Kos nor the costly jewels with which they are adorned can ever bring you back the things that time has locked away for good in its well-known box. Where has your beauty gone? Where has it gone? Where is your fair complexion? Where, alas, the grace with which you walked? Lysia, you whose breath was the very breath of love itself, who stole me from myself, O oh, Lysia, you who exult, exulted so when beautiful Kinnera died, leaving your beauty unrivaled, where has it gone? What is there left? When Kinnera died young, the gods gave early death to her as a gift, and Lysia they gave all your years to you to give the young men something for them to laugh at. 
old crow, old torch burned out, fallen away to ashes. Here's another example. Horace's Ode, the 18th Ode of the third book to Faunus. Sometimes, of course, the failures that are thrilled reading of the original provide one with the knowledge of, of our inevitable consequences, not just of differences in talent or time or the resources that come rightly or wrongly from one's other reading, but of what the syntax of another language cannot do, can do. I've used this example before in another recent talk and in print, but it's an, an instructive one. I think. Ophonus, when pursuing a nymph in flight, you come to the edge of the sunny fields of my farm. Be gentle as you pass across those fields, and in your passing by, propitious be to the nurslings of my flock, I pray. For when the fullness of the year comes round again, we celebrate your day, and on that day a tender kid is offered up to you, and in the mixing bowl there's plenty of wine that's love's companion. And the incense smoke pours out with many odors from the altar, and all the flocks and herds can play in the fields, and all the people, too, in holiday dress Keep holiday among the idle creatures because it is your day. Among the lambs who have no fear of him, there is the wolf on holiday too, taking a friendly walk in honor of you. And in your honor too, the trees have scattered their leaves upon the ground. And he whose daily toil it is to dig dances today, stamping his holiday feet in triple rhythm on the enemy earth. There's the final quatrain of the Latin. Intraudacis lupus erat agnos, sparget agrestus, tibi silva frondes, gaudet in visam, papulise fossor, terpede teram. The first line of it. Dradakis lupus erat agnos. I tried to get in some sense of how sinister it is by that gangster taking a friendly walk. But there's really no way for English syntax to do what the Latin does. That holiday wolf, lupus, right in the middle of those for the moment audacious lambs is exactly halfway along in his wandering among them too close for comfort, the grammar of the line proleptically dismembering the lambs, coming between their adjective, adakis, and their noun, uh, agnos, between their audacity and their bodies. The wolf is wandering in there. He's good at that. Harmless today, this holiday day, but watch out tomorrow. This is the way he hunts. And there are the last two lines of the final quatrain. Gaudet in visam papulise fossor ter pede teram. Gaudet rejoices next to in visam, the hated. There's something frantic in the joyful holiday dancing of papulise, striking, beating. It can also mean driving away, rejecting. The object of that adjective in Wisam, hated, which is right in there in the holiday line in this joyous poem, and the adjective turns out to be attached to the earth, the digger has to dig in on all those other days. But in the Latin, the object is held off while all that joyfulness and frantic dancing is going on. Teram springs its surprise as the last word of the poem. I think I did spring some of that pride, uh, surprise by holding off enemy, or, as I might have said it, hated, till the penultimate word, uh, but I lost some of the force of its adjective in Wisam as Horace introduces it in the preceding line. In there, like the wolf, 
in the context of that rejoicing and that dancing, making us wait for its attachment to its noun. I had to spring the surprise more bluntly, less insidiously, by coupling adjective and noun, enemy earth, as the last two words. So some of that complex activity of the last two lines was irretrievably lost. Here again, I don't see how I could have done it differently because English syntax can't do some of the things Latin syntax can do. I couldn't get it right, but my point isn't simply that this failure uh, isn't simply an experience of disappointment. It's also an experience of vivid, close reading for me. The work of the translator, I'm sure you feel that too, as, uh, 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 who have, who have uh, uh, translated, when dealing with a wonderful text is the most intense and vivid kind of reading there is. And there's joy in that that the necessary failure makes even more vivid. Of course, this compensatory joy in the reading occurs only when you can feel that you've, after all, done your best and brought your translation to the point of its inevitable helplessness. When I translated this poem, I didn't know Virgil's Georgic, but Horace did, and my reading of this ode has been greatly changed by my experience of translating several passages of the Georgics. First of all, from the second. Then, too, you must be sure that there are hedges to keep the beasts away, especially when the leaves are young and tender, still ignorant of trouble and untested, Worse than winter's harshness and the tyranny of the sun are the buffalo and deer when they can get in at the vines and make themselves free with them. And sheep and hungry heifers feed on them too. The coldest frost and the most oppressive heat that weighs down on a thirsting, lands a thirsting landscape don't do half as much harm as beasts with their venomous teeth and the scars of their gnawing on the helpless stems. This is the crime, no other, for which the goat is sacrificed to Bacchus at all the altars. And old time stage plays had their first beginning on such occasions in rural villages or down at the nearby crossroads with singing contests and dancing on oiled goatskins in the meadows. And indeed, even today in country places, lots of laughing the peasants put on fearsome masks made out of hollowed cork, chant their uncouth verses, and Bacchus sing their joyful songs to you. And on the pine tree branches hang little amulet faces that sway in the breeze. And so the vines grow ripe and lavishly bring forth their fruit. And every vale and glade is full to overflowing everywhere to which the pleased God turns his beautiful face. So as is right for us to do, we'll sing our rustic songs in honor of the God, and taking the goat by the horn, we'll lead him up to the sacrificial altar and afterwards roast the rich goat meat on spits of hazel wood. That same joyfulness in the ceremony uh, and that same uh, anxiety um, and uh, and and I don't know the noun propitiatoriness in the uh, in the uh, 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 in the ceremony uh, itself, uh, and I didn't know. Um, um, when I translated the, uh, this uh, ode to Faunus, uh, these passages from the Georgics either, both of them having to do with the wolf. This is from the end, the apocalyptic end of the first Georgic. And not only the sun, but the earth and the sea gave signs and dogs and birds gave signs of ill to come. How many times have we seen Etna burst 
sending forth rocks and whirling balls of flame, pouring her rivers of fire down on the plains. Germany heard across the skies the sound of warfare, and the Alps themselves were shaken. At twilight in the evening, ghosts were seen, or strange, pale simulacra of human beings. In a silent grove, many attested to this. A loud voice was suddenly heard to speak. And animals, too, were suddenly heard to speak. Unspeakable were the voices of men and women. Rivers stopped in their courses. Earth opened up wide. Tears dropped from the eyes of ivory statues in temples. Bronzes broke into sweat. The river Po, the king of rivers, insanely overflowed and with its whirling waters washed away entire uprooted forests and carried off whole herds and their stables together across the plains. At this time, too, menacing threads showed up in the entrails of birds, haruspicators red, and blood was in the water drawn up from wells. The ululating howls of wolves were heard echoing in the streets of high hill towns. Never were there more times when lightning struck down from a perfectly cloudless sky, and never were there more terrible comets to be seen. And this passage from the end of the third Georgic, the time of a plague when all the animals were dying. At that time there, they say, men looked for cattle to sacrifice in the rituals of Juno, and there were nowhere any to be found. Ill-matched wild oxen had to be used to pull the chariots up to the goddess's mountain temple and men had to scratch at the earth by themselves with harrows and use their own fingernails to dig the holes to plant their seeds in and their own strained necks to drag their creaking wagons up the hills. No treacherous wolf then reconnoitered the sheepfold nor prowled nocturnally around the flock. His own acute distress had made him tame and timid does and shy elusive stags wandered in public where there are dogs and houses and there were many creatures of the deep whose corpses lay on beaches like the bodies of shipwrecked sailors washed up by the waves and sea calves fled from the sea to freshwater rivers and the viper perished having vainly wound into its winding hiding place to hide. And the hydra, too, its astonished scales erect. And was the air hospitable to birds? Falling, they left their lives up under the clouds. Now were there remedies that made things better? The knowledge of those who study remedies, like Chiron, the son of Philirides, or, or Melampus, the son of Amitheon, only did harm. Um, I don't know uh, whether, if I had been more aware of these passages, whether it would have changed anything in my translation of the, uh, um, of the poem. I don't see how it could have, but it changes my reading of, of, the, of the poem. Uh, uh, that uh, that holiday wolf in that joyful um, poem is related to those wolves in these other um, passages. And the poem, I think, knows it and wants us to know it. The case of Ode 213 is different. It shows how the best intentions in the world can blind the translator to what's there, even while he's responding to things that are indeed genuinely there. And it also shows, stunningly to me, how my reading of that great poem with which I'm deeply in love has taken another step as my reading of it is affected by something I translated later. 
213 is a great case in point because of the distance traveled by Horace's tone of, uh, pardon me a second, I just want to be sure I have a poem in front of me. Or maybe I better read the whole, the, uh, whole um, uh, translation first. This is like, <laughs> I've called this a, a, addressed to a tree falling on his estate. In several of the odes, Horace refers to an incident when he, he nearly got killed by <clears throat> this falling tree. Uh, and the poem is, a, is, is, to me, one of the great examples of that extraordinary uh, capacity of Horace's tone to travel a very, very great distance uh, in a very short space. Whoever it may have been who planted you, he chose an unholy day to do it on and nurtured you profanely with intent against the future and to disgrace this valley. That man probably strangled his own father. His hearth is probably stained with the blood of a house guest he'd murdered at midnight. He's probably expert at poison or any other crime you choose to name. That man who planted you, you wretched, rotten, falling tree come down on your master's head. Nobody watches out for what he should watch out for. Thus the Phoenician sailor is scared of the Bosporus, but he isn't scared of the fate that lies beyond. The Roman soldier is scared of the Parthians' arrows, the Parthians scared of the Romans, but that which will take them away can't be foreseen. How close I came to being brought down to see the house of dark Persephone and to see the chair that Aeacus sits on making his judgment and to see the place down there set apart for the just. How close I came to hearing the music of Sappho complaining of those young women of her island and the ampler music of Alcaeus as with a golden plectrum he plucks the strings and tells of the hardships of voyage the hardships of exile and war. The shades down there gather together to hear the music of Alcaeus and of Sappho. Hushed, they wonder at both, but most of all, shoulder to ghostly shoulder, thronging, they listen to stories of battle and tyrants expelled from their thrones the many-headed monster Cerberus listens, his black ears lowered to hear Alcaeus' music. The snakes in the hair of the Furies pause in their writhing. Prometheus and Tantalus suspend their suffering for a while. Orion the hunter ceases to chase the lion and timid lynx. Uh, I was so dazzled by the turn on the dime um, changes in tonality in that uh, in in that poem that uh, uh, that I think there are many things that I uh, um, that I I I missed, for example. Um, to make it a great case in point because of the distance traveled by Horace's tone of voice from the hilarious self-ridiculing uh, comedy of the rage-filled opening line um, uh, and all those uh, teeth clenched, spit through your teeth, T sounds in te and posewit, parentes and tractawit and all those others, te, triste, lignum and all those spit in the back of your throat Q and, and hard C sounds of his comical rage, quick cunque and quick quid, caricem cruore and, and colca and concipitur. Uh, and I had my own ways of trying to get some of this. Who, whoever it may have been who planted you, he chose an unholy day to do it on 
and nurtured you profanely with intent against the future and to disgrace this valley. That man probably strangled his own father. His hearth is probably stained with the blood of a house guest he murdered at midnight. He's probably expert at poison or any other crime you choose to name. Strangled and stained and expert and planted and profanely and probably and probably and planted you and you, you and the absence of punctuation and some imitation of pell-mell accusing its own music as any poem has its own music but the experience of translating it was also the experience of hearing that spitting Horatian music disappear as the translation serially erased that which it was translating and then of course the first big event in the transition is a different tonal register Horace moves into the first generalization in the sound of music that resembles the music of T and hard C, and, and uh, after quick quid, usque comes quid quisque vitet. As you read the sentence, the tone begins to change as the key signature, uh, uh, signature so to speak, remains the same as he moves into his generaliz generalization. But your imagination's ear is still hearing sounds it's heard earlier and that it's lived on for its pleasure. So the surprise begins to happen as if it isn't a surprise at all. Uh, I tried to move into the first generalization with a colloquial idiom, different from what I'd been using before, uh, different from you, you, and wretched, rotten, and so on. Nobody watches out for what he should watch out for. And then the examples, the Phoenician sailor and the Romans scared of the Parthians, Parthians of the Romans, and the second generalization framing these examples with the first generalization, the other frame, but that which will take them away can't be foreseen. The colloquialism or the conversationalism, as one might call it, is meant to be the bridge or stairway up to the more drastic change of tone that it was coming, and I think maybe it was. But in my concentration on how to do this without too crass a shift from what the opening lines were doing, I didn't, I couldn't fully hear what in the case of the full of the first generalization, quid quisque vitet numquam homini satis cautes in horas, I couldn't fully hear how broadly far out the generalization was reaching with homini, or how the idiom in horas, hour after hour, keeps it in touch at once with what the sa sailors and soldiers and everyone has to fear and doesn't know what to do about but how this goes on in everybody's quotidian hour, including the hour when your tree might fall on your head. There's an elevation and a deepening and darkening in Horace's diction here that nobody watches out for what he should watch out for, gets at some of, some of but only some of. And in the Phoenician scaler, of sailors scared of the Bosporus, but he isn't scared of the fate that lies beyond. I hope the line break, fate that lies beyond, would get at some of kaika fata, but it doesn't get at the effect of that rhyming ultra kaika fata or valiunde with the red randomness that goes with fates understood as unseen or as blind. When fate gets me, the only thing worse than if he knows what he's doing when he gets me is if he doesn't and he's just blundering around. Of course, the biggest thing of all is at the end, when the relation of the poem to the story, uh, 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 to the story of Orpheus and Eurydice came clear to me after the fact of the translating. And I'd like to read that, uh, uh, that passage. And I think I would <coughs> like to conclude uh, with that passage, at, with the exception of one short poem at the, at the end. And I think just because the story is so great that I'll read beyond the passage that's uh, relevant, but I think you'll hear it when it's coming. It's, uh, it's what, uh, what one hears at the end of the, of the, um, of the ode I've been talking about.
hushed, they wonder at both, but most of all, shoulder to ghostly shoulder thronging, they listen to stories of battle and tyrants expelled from their thrones. To many-headed monsters, Cerberus listens, his black ears lowered to hear Alcaeus's music. The snakes in the hair of the Furies pause in their writhing. Prometheus and Tantalus suspend their suffering for a while. Orion, the hunter, ceases to chase the lion and timid lynx. Orpheus's wife, Eurydice, has been, uh, while being pursued um, by Aristeus, has been bitten by a snake and dies. And I'll pick up the story at this point. The cries of the sister bands of dryads filled the air as high as the mountaintops. The cliffs of Rhodope wept. The cliffs of Pangaea wept. And the warrior band of the Getai, Orethia, Hebrus. Alone upon the unfrequented shore, Orpheus, playing his lyre, sang to himself his songs of you, dear wife, as day came on with the light of the morning sun and as the light descended in the evening. Singing he went down through the very throat of Tenerus, the high gate of the dark kingdom of Dis, and through the murky grove where terror dwells in black obscurity, and entered into the Mani's place, the place of the frightful king, and the hearts no human prayers can cause to pity. And set in motion by the sound of music, from the lowest depths of Erebus there came as numerous as the many hundred birds that driven there by the coming on of evening or by a winter storm fly in for shelter in the foliage of a grove, the flittering shades, the unsubstantial phantom shapes of those for whom there is not any light at all. Women and men, famous, great-hearted heroes, the life in their hero bodies now defunct, unmarried boys and girls, sons from their fathers had had to watch being placed on the funeral pyre, and all around them the hideous tangling reeds and the black ooze of Coquito's swampy waters. Nine times Styx wound its fettering chain around them, and the house of death was spellbound by his music all the way down to the bottom of Tartarus. Spellbound the snakes in the hair of the Furies, too. Cerberus, all three mouths were open-mouthed and silent, and Ixion's wheel stopped turning. And now, as he was carefully going back the way he came, and step by step avoiding all possible wrong steps, and step by step Eurydice, whom he was bringing back, unseen behind his back, was following, for this is what Proserpina had commanded. They were coming very near the upper air, and a sudden madness seized him, madness of love, a madness to be forgiven if hell but knew how to forgive. He stopped in his tracks, and just as they were just about to emerge out into the light, suddenly, seized by love, bewildered into heedlessness, alas, his purpose overcome, he turned and looked back at Eurydice. And then and there, his labor was spilled and flowed away like water. The implacable tyrant broke the pact. Three times the pools of Avernus heard the sound of thunder. What was it, she cried? What madness, Orpheus, was it that has destroyed us, you and me? Oh, look, the cruel fates already call me back, and sleep is covering over my swimming eyes. Farewell, 
I'm being carried off into the vast surrounding dark and reaching out my strengthless hands to you forevermore. Alas, not yours. And saying this, like smoke disintegrating into air, she was dispersed away and vanished from his eyes and never saw him again. And he was left clutching at shadows with so much still to say. And the boatman never again would take him across the barrier of the marshy waters of hell. What could he do? His wife, twice taken from him, how could he bear it? How could his tears move hell? The Stygian boat has carried her away. And it is said that he, day after day, for seven months beside the river streaming, sat underneath a towering cliff and wept and sang and told in song his story. Entranced, the wild beasts listened. Entranced, the oak trees moved closer to hear the song, which was like that of the nightingale in the shade of a poplar tree in mourning for her children who were taken as yet unfledged by a herdsman, hard of heart. Who had happened, hard of heart, who had happened upon the nest? She weeps all night and over and over repeats her lamentation and fills the listening air with her sad complaint. I'd like to just conclude with a, <clears throat> a newish poem of my own which has to do with reading and was not getting it right. It's called In the Reading Room. Alone in the library room, even when others are there in the room alone, except for themselves, there is the illusion of peace. The air in the room is stilled. There are reading lights on the tables, looking as if they're reading, looking as if they're studying the text and understanding, shedding light on what the words are saying under their steady, imbecile gaze. The page is blank, patiently waiting not to be blank. The page is blank until the mind that reads crosses the Black River, seeking the queen of the underworld, Persephone, where she sits by the side of the one who brought her there from Enna. Hades, the mute, the deaf, king of the dead letter. She is clothed in the beautiful garment of our thousand misunderstandings of the sacred text. Thank you. I can't pretend it's not daunting to be speaking after so beautiful and moving a meditation as that. Part of me doesn't want to do this, but part of me does, so I'll yield to that second part and start by thanking uh, Tim Peltison for having invited me to speak tonight. Uh, a great honor, even if, as noted, by both of us a challenging one, and by thanking David Ferry for having invited me into his experience of translating and for all the friendship and illumination I've found there. I'll make four points in these remarks. Each has a twofold goal, 
to open up a wider space of admiration for David's practice as a translator and to draw out some of the implications of that practice for how we think and talk about translation in general. Point one, to speak as eloquently about not getting it right as David does means acknowledging that there's such a thing as getting it right in the first place, an exactness of rendition that one can see and should strive for even if one's not going to succeed. That fact distinguishes David's practice in translation from the practices of those translators who don't acknowledge getting it right as a goal, and whose relation to their originals is arbitrary and casual and, frankly, lazy. The same fact associates David's practice with some practices one might think of as opposed to it. What I have in mind is the practices of Martin Buber and Franz Rosenzweig, whose German translation of the Hebrew Bible is a great triumph, maybe the greatest triumph, for the literalist translator's passionate desire to render the original word for word and root for root. Now their translation, read as translation, makes a quite different effect from that of David's work. And in a dialogue among translators, they and David would initially find themselves in opposing camps. But not for long, I think. There's in fact a phrase of Rosenzweig's I've often thought of in connection with David's practice, maybe most insistently when reading the scrupulous notes he made in preparing his wonderful translation of De Wilde Alexander's Hier vor do wir Kinder waren, which his reading began with. Rosenzweig wrote to Buber that in their collaboration, his special role would be that of what he called die Muse der Gründlichkeit, which I would translate as the muse of precision. Rosenzweig knew that was a paradoxical phrase, we think of muses as sources of inspiration, not as philologists. But we're wrong, partly because the distinction between inspiration and philology is wrong. And the muse of precision is the one who reminds us that getting it right matters as a standard even if we can't attain it. Rosenzweig found energy in his belief that he was getting it right, David in the acknowledgement that he's not, but the muse of precision, we might say the muse of getting it right, matters to both of them. Point two. To my ear, David's phrase, not getting it right, has something in common with Robert Frost's great epigram that poetry is what gets lost in translation. And this second point will have to do with some implications I think the two phrases have in common. Frost's phrase sometimes gets read as a rejection of translation. If translation is what's left over when poetry has gotten lost, then the translation of poetry is an oxymoron, the enterprise nonsensical, the result inevitably a failure. And there's certainly justification for reading the remark in that way. Many translations of poetry are, in fact, flat and prosy, and it's good to be reminded of that fact so forthrightly against the temptation to judge such translations by a lower standard, to say we find poetry in them when it isn't there. But there's another way to read Frost's sentence, one more in accord with what I think of as David's rewriting of it, Frost's sentence isn't only a critique, it's also a definition. What he implicitly asks is the nature of poetry. And he answers, the nature of poetry is that it gets lost in translation, which means that it's also found there in the process, if not in the result, in that the process by which some verbal phenomenon gets lost in translation is the process that reveals that phenomenon as poetry. A great poet, 
say, David Ferry, has translated another great poet, say, Ronsard. I'm going to take up an example that David spoke of very beautifully. That looking back on his experience, David sees what he hasn't gotten right. Ronsard ne célébré du temps que j'étais belle has become Ronsard praised this body before it became this fright. A good translation, I still think. But looking back on it, David sees what he hasn't gotten right, sees the, quote, smart-ass quality to the solution that's at odds with the noble regretfulness of du temps que j'étais belle. And the noble regretfulness, the thing that he hasn't gotten right, is revealed as poetry precisely by the fact of having been gotten wrong. In this context, Franz Kafka's great parable before the law seems a parable about translation. The translator resembles the man in that parable who comes from the country to seek the law, and who at the end in the darkness of his own failure to reach the law, sees at last the radiance of the law unquenchably breaking forth from the door that keeps him away from it. But if that's the case, and this is my third point, then maybe in the history of talking and writing about translation, we've been looking at the wrong moment in the translational experience to figure out what the experience really is, really can offer. That is, everyone here, I'm sure, having heard David's beautiful meditations on what happens after the translation is, in one way at any rate, finished, will have sensed how rich an experience it is when a translator comes back to a translation and looks at it freshly and humbly. But nowhere in the translation theory I've read, and I've read a fair amount of it, have I come across another translator who's made a comparable exploration. Translators presenting the process of translation present it as being finished when the words are put on the printed page. They explain, often very vividly, the slow progress towards the finished product, the blind alleys and flashes of inspiration, the small but crucial adjustments in the last polishing. But then the account stops. They don't tell us, as David does tell us, what happens when the translator, now free to review and rejudge, having grown older, read other poems, written other poems, become a different person, looks back at the translation and at the translator who made it. David writes, the experience of not getting it right, and knowing exactly how you're not getting it right, is an intense and valuable form of reading. I agree. I'd only add that in the field of translation theory, the choice to focus on that experience is an innovation and a revelation. My last point reflects what might be my only dissent in friendship and respect from David's view of translation. It has to do with how good a translation can be in comparison with its original. The experience of translating is, as David suggests, at its best an examined experience of not getting it right. Poetry is what gets lost in translation, if by poetry we mean the poetry of the original text. But if by that frost means that there's no poetry at all in translations, if David takes not getting it right to mean always making it worse, then, again, in respect and friendship, I disagree. There may be something like a law that no translation can reproduce the poetry of its original, but there's no law saying that a translation can't surpass it. And when you're dealing with a great translator, and I believe David is that in the strict sense of the word, then you don't want your critical judgment constrained by the unexamined orthodoxy that translations are inferior to originals, even if that orthodoxy is in most cases true, because sometimes it's false. 
An example from a poem David hasn't discussed tonight, in which therefore I get the pleasure of reading, and which is on the other hand up, the one that just has about eight lines on it, half in English and half in German, um, is uh, David's translation of uh, Rilke's Herbsttag, uh, the last stanza. This is David's poem. Who has no house will never have one now. Who is alone will spend his days alone. Will wake to read some pages of a book. Will write long letters. Wander unpeacefully in the late streets while the leaves stray down. And this is Rilke's. Wer jetzt kein Haus hat, baut sich keines mehr. Wer jetzt allein ist, wird es lange bleiben, wird wachen, lesen, lange Briefe schreiben und wird in den Alleen hin und her unruhig wandern, wenn die Blätter treiben. Now, David's rendering doesn't get it right, doesn't have, say, the beautiful orderliness of Rilke's lines, the urgency of wachen, lesen, lange Briefe schreiben, wake, read, write long letters compressed into a single line, the broad range of meanings of the poem's last word, treiben, applicable not only to leaves drifting in the wind, but also to ships, hunks of ice on rivers, and sap rising in trees. But in some ways, David's poem is, however heretical it may seem to say this, better. Unpeacefully is stranger, more perturbed than unruhig. The late streets is a beauty in David's poem that isn't in Rilke's, maybe because David had read Frost's poem, I have been one acquainted with the night, and Rilke hadn't. And the exactness of the leaves stray down is at least as good as the wide generality of die Blätter treiben. Not getting it right, in this case, and in many in David's work, and in the work of other great translators, means making it new. Like translators, critics inevitably don't get it right, and I'm looking forward to the moment when I can review these tentative remarks of mine figure out what they misconstrue, and thereby see the force of the truths I got wrong. For the moment, I'll end by stating again my gratitude to David Ferry for inviting me to be a friend in his work of translation and for allowing me thereby to think more freely as a critic in relation to his great example. Sometimes you feel that there, you have an affinity with a poem. Sometimes, if I'm remembering rightly some conversations we've had, you start because you're energized by a bad translation of a poem you might think have a, has a great original behind it. 
Um, I assume sometimes in your case, sometimes you continue because you have a sense of the whole, and you've gotten a bit, of, you've done a bit of Horace or a bit of Virgil, and you think there's a there's a larger shape here that's worth being able to render. Um, the only in my own case, the I remember an odd experience of, of reading one piece by a German writer named uh, Günther Puna um, about being photographed and the, the experience of being photographed and then tracked, as it were, in the photograph album. And I was so struck by that that I went on to do several other pieces because I thought this is, is an imagination I would like to be in intimate content. So. That, that's the kind of thing that happens a <laughs> a lot of, I think I'm <clears throat> sorry, I don't know where this is going. The, uh, it just, it varies so much from one kind of thing to another. In my case, I'm, I've been, uh, I started getting into some stuff by giving, being given assignments. Um, I got into the, the Gilgamesh <clears throat> business because my friend William Moran was uh, the, you know, seriologist, Hancho at Harvard, was a good friend of mine. Uh, gave me a couple of word-for-word -word passages to work on, and I got hooked. Uh, I got into the oat uh, business, legitimately or not, uh, because uh, Donald Karn Ross at, uh, at BU liked some stuff that I'd done. He gave me some assignments, and I got hooked. Uh, and then, of course, once I'd done the oats of Paris, done the oats of Paris, uh, um, and the epistles, uh, and so on. I don't know if I'm going to go on and try to work on the satires or not. Once I've worked on the eclogues of Virgil, uh, I had to work on the Georgians of Virgil, and I began to see lots of things in Virgil that had to do with my own work on uh, words words. And I began to see how um, Wordsworth and uh, how Georgic Wordsworth is, uh, and how Georgic Robert Frost is uh, uh, in in the poem uh, uh, directed, for example, how how much what the Georgics are about as I read them is the the vulnerability of of cultures and bodies and 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 and, 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 and everything and the preciousness of, of those things because of their vulnerability and uh, and, and so on like again it's now everything we it is Georgia especially certain certain writers because uh, of because of those those uh, things and so my my getting that sense early in, in, in working on the first uh, first of the Georgics meant that I had to to work on the rest. Uh, the same thing I, I learned sort of after the fact that Robert Frost's poem "Provide Provide" is uh, is a, a powerfully, marvelously Horatian poem, and related to that. Uh, 13th, uh, that uh, 13th ode of the fourth book, for example, that I read, the one that I called Theresia, and uh, so on. So, so it's all connected with one's whole reading life, I think, and, uh, and, and you can't, it's hard to chart from one instance to another with any consistency, but it's all happening across those boundaries, I think. I don't know if that speaks to the question. I should say, by the way, that if they would decide to translate the satires of Horus, I'll, I'll gracefully give up my s sustained attempts to get him to consider doing the Aeneid. Um, <laughs> other, yeah, if I'm... I, I don't just uh, Yeah, 
Yeah, yes, yes. That, that the sense of what was uh, achieved in that translation, because obviously a lot of things going on with the Ronsa, the 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 the, the, the forest, There is a sense in which perhaps still within the body, but there is uh, the, the journey into this ancient culture. The, well, the way you really brought this thing together, I, I, I'm just so fascinated. I don't know if it's all the well, you know, I mean, one thing I, I knew even I know even less. <laughs> the, what I'm doing in the case of the yoga since I don't know, I can't read Kinyafuam, I don't know Babylonian, uh, and so on. So, so I'm uh, even less than I know about uh, Latin and French and German and other things I've ventured into. Uh, but that sense, I mean, dealing with the yoga that I was tempted at a separate time to read a passage from the, the yoga uh, because in fact I quote myself for once in, the, uh, in that uh, uh, Orpheus and Eurydice passage when I say that those for whom there is there is not any light at all and so on is uh, a line from my not translation but rendering of the of the uh, dream that the wild man Enkidu has when he's uh, uh, when he's dying and I was just uh, so astonished by the similarities of. Uh, but in that account, that ancient, ancient account, and Virgil's by, by comparison, modern account, in, in the sense of that, of that uh, story, and you're absolutely right, that sense of ancientness in it is, uh, is so, so powerful part of that, that particular experience. My wife and I just came out from Paris and, and in, the, in the Louvre, so some of those Tablets were the very first writing that, that there ever was, and the guild measured much later than that. But that, that just nothing like seeing that. That's the first, first imprinting on a, on a clay tablet and so on. There's some sense of that dealing with that particular text of that, that oldness here. Yeah. 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 Uh, forgive me if I should know this, but I wonder if either of you ever find yourself translating from English into some other language. Can you say something like that? Because you really have to know the other language. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I said. I've proofread instruction and pamphlets involving translations of how to manage a Scrutus alarm clock, <laughs> but I don't <laughs> I think that's what we have in mind. <laughs> yeah. I just wanted to say how much I appreciated how much David and you too, Larry, really have said about the excitement of looking at something that's very old. I was very moved by what you said about seeing the clay tablets. This is something I feel every time I translate, and I don't do it in a way that makes it into beautiful English. It's just a literal translation that somebody can it's do. It's just right. <laughs> well, I wouldn't even go that far. <laughs> but there is something wonderful about that moment of contact, even though you know you're not, and I feel this very intensely, that you're not getting it quite right, because just the act of putting it into English is modernizing and changing. You can't help it. I'm not seeing anybody else's hand, and that might be a wonderful, interesting remark. Thank you to both of you.